Very good to have your company. I'm David Foster. Now, a question for you. Are you a lockdown landscaper, a budding, quite literally, horticulturalist? Because coronavirus has seen many people take to the garden as a way of getting out, getting food and peace of mind. This is Roundtable. OK, on this programme, we will be looking at growing your own, not just food, but flowers, too, and how that, it's believed, can help relieve mental stress. And we have tips from the top on how to make the best of these bad times. For many people forced to stay at home by the pandemic, gardening has become a way to pass the time productively. Sales of fruit and vegetable seeds have increased as people turn to their garden or window box to channel their time and energy. And as lockdown restrictions make shopping more difficult for some, it can even help to put food on the table. Researchers say gardening may be a rare positive trend to emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. With so many digging into the hobby for the first time, there's also been a push to pool resources and share tips on home food production. Has the pandemic started a quiet horticultural revolution, one that could make life a little more sustainable after the virus threat has gone? Time for us to start digging for answers. In a short while, we'll be talking to David Dominey, chartered horticulturalist and broadcaster. Also, Sue Stewart-Smith, psychiatrist and psychotherapist and author of The Well-Gardened Mind. But first, we welcome Professor Alistair Griffiths, Director of Science at Britain's Royal Horticultural Society, and Hector Chowdhury, who goes by the name Garden Up on her popular YouTube page. Very warm welcome to both of you. Hector, I mean, even a couple of years ago, you were getting one and a half million, 1.8 million hits on your site. You've got half a million subscribers. Have you seen an uptick in the interest? Yes, suddenly. I think uh, about one month back, we see that suddenly people have started growing plants and they're interested. I see so many Instagram queries on what they should be growing and how should they go about it. So I think, yes, there is a sudden increase in interest in gardening. And any areas in particular? Edibles. I think uh, people, irrespective of what kind of space they have, it seems that they want to grow their own food now. And that's quite interesting, actually, for me, because earlier I would see a lot of people interested in ornamentals, in flowers and indoor plants. But now, suddenly, people of all ages, right from 20, in 20s to 60s, they want to grow their own food. So, yeah, I don't know where this is going to go, but this is quite fun for me to watch as a, as a gardener myself. Well, I think I know where it's going to go, and hopefully if it's any good, it will end up on the plate. Um, we'll be back with you, Hector, in, in just a moment. Alistair, let me quote something, first of all. It, it's from Diane Blazik, National Garden Bureau, who says, we will come out in the end, and hopefully everyone will be eating better and gardening more and more self-reliant. I know that would be your wish. Do you think that's going to be the case? I think so. I mean, you know, even during this time, so the RHS charity has been helping gardeners. And, you know, since lockdown, 22 million uh, visits to our website to help people grow. We've had 500 percent up on our um, view of our free advice. And our members advisory service has been up 150 percent. Many of these are our new people. And I think, you know, the the challenge has been around people uh, becoming disconnected with nature and then getting out and growing um, is really, I think, helping with, with that cause. Well, there couldn't be two people better qualified to help me with this. I'm going to show a couple of pictures of the little vegetable patch I've been, had going in my back garden for about uh, four weeks now, mostly salad leaves, doing reasonably well. But there's one right in the middle there. I have no idea what it is. And I've shown it to both of you before this programme. Hector, I'm going to ask you for a guess. What do you think it is? It's a red kale. It's a Russian kale. So, yeah, I think it's doing fine, actually. Uh, you can eat it as a salad and you can cook it as well. Alistair, do you agree? 
Yeah, yeah, Russian kale, you munch it, it's packed with nutrients. It's one of those really nutri nutritious things. Has a bit of a taste because it has a bit of a kick. So it's got uh, it's from the, the, the brassica family. Um, but there are different varieties with different tastes. Yeah, well, it may be good for you. We had a bit last night. I, I didn't really like the taste. But thank you anyway for that. Alistair, you, you think people before all of this were becoming disconnected from nature. Reasons why? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's there's two things. There's a philosophical thing called plant blindness, which is talking about being disconnected with nature, even though we use plants in our daily lives. We've been distanced from that, even within sort of a city and urban environment. So our habitats have changed. Um, and you can still pack your, your house or small area with plants. And I think, you know, in times of crisis, people will tend to turn back to what is uh, in, in, in their control or what is normal. And, and nature is often... Um, the thing that, that people will go back to, which is interesting. I mean, it's, it's, it's our habitat. And actually, I mean, you, talking of small spaces, you, you've got a small balcony, you're in Mumbai, massive population um, in India's second city. Um, what do you get out of it, other, other than the fact that you can show people how, how this is done and that you are earning an income through doing so? But what do you get out of it? I think the sense of joy. And uh, the way I started it was that I had just finished my field work in southern tropical forests of India. And I really missed the greens in my hostel room. So I started with just one or two edibles, tomatoes, which are the easiest to grow. And then outside my lab, outside my hostel, in my balcony, I had so many edibles within six, seven months. So that, I think that sense of joy, that accomplishment that you grew this and you can harvest it and eat it. That is something that that it's it's more than a hobby. It's not. I feel that's better than painting because you can actually eat it. So that kick that you get of doing something like that of your own and you can harvest it is wonderful. And and really vital in this time we're living through. I agree. Yes, and I I think that's the reason that everybody is suddenly very interested in how to grow their edibles because this is one of the basic skills that. To human existence which is really important right okay alistair a second class for you second bit of expert tips for david foster at home with his miniature vegetable patch the radish you can see uh doing reasonably well i'm not sure how i'll know when that's ready to eat but uh, unfortunately the sweet corn or the corn on the cob that looks a little bit sad as does well the carrot help me um, so on the sweet corn, it, it, you may put it out a little bit too early because it needs sort of day temperature 20, uh, night temperatures 12. I think you can get them through. You might need to give them a bit of uh, protection. They tend to need to be about 30 centimetres apart. So um, I think that as long as we get the warmer weather, I think, you know, you, 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 could, be, you could be OK on that. The carrots. Um, the carrots have got a sneaky tomato plant in there, so I would um, either transplant the tomato to plant. It's a bit wet, um, uh, a bit waterlogged, but I think, again, they will come through in that container. If you were to plant them out, um, I would plant the whole thing. Don't those hate um, having disturbance um, carrot roots? But, yeah, that's my okay. thoughts. That's obviously where the um, tomato seed went. They fell out the bottom of a packet. So that's something I've learned. Um, Hector, you went from elephants and ecology in your PhD to this. Any regrets? What would you tell people thinking of doing it? No regrets, actually. Uh, I mean, staying in Bombay, I, this is probably the best thing I could do to make myself feel calm, to have a little balcony garden. Of course, I wish to have a bigger land, but with my current a profession and my husband's um, needs for his job we need to uh, be living in the main city and this is the best I've got so I'm trying to use that balcony as much possible and um, there's no regrets from shifting from elephants to um, having my own little balcony to grow my vegetables because after finishing my PhD I wanted to develop my own business of some sort and this is an empty niche uh, that I figured uh, because I could connect with so many people of my age about gardening mm. because not a lot of people out there have the luxury of acres of land. There are many people like... Okay, so it's, it's not just balcony. old people, old crusties. 
Um, it's people of your age who love this sort of thing as well. Yes. Fantastic. What is the one virtue you need to have as a as a gardener? Is it patience, Alistair? Um, I, I think this green fingers lark is a, is a bit of a myth. I think it's it's just learning that you will make mistakes and and, and learn from them and grow yourself and uh, start off with the easy things and, and just get out and grow because it is extremely good for your mental, your physical. And, and you know, when everything when we come out of this COVID crisis, your social well-being. And so salad leaves, radishes, beetroot corn on the cob, chives, they are simple things, are they? That's where I am. I mean, one of the most simplest ones that I would say is strawberries. It's it's absolute giver. It's, you know, it, it's a lovely taste. It's a lovely colour. Um, and and the scent is, it sort of brings a happiness, a fruity strawberry happiness uh, smell to it. Oh, fantastic. Um, Hector, what was it that really made you fall in love with this? And the same question for you, Alistair, in just a moment. Only that sense of achievement that I could grow this and I could eat it. Um, even if I can't grow enough to fulfill our needs or daily needs of food for a family of two. But despite that, even if I have few cherry tomatoes in my balcony, it gives me so much joy. So that's something that I look forward to. Every day I wake up and I go to my balcony to check out what's going on. And uh, because I'm in a high rise and there's not a lot of bees, so I also hand pollinate a little. And I'm every day, every morning, I'm looking forward to it. Hector, thanks very much indeed. Alistair, we're going to take a look at uh, two of my other plants, courgette. And I want you to tell me how easy they are, how many zucchini courgette I'm going to get from it, but also explain your love. You're, you're a professor of horticulture. What drew you to it? I mean, what, what drew to me, well, to be honest, was my, was my granddad. Um, uh, my granddad was a passionate gardener. But then as, as I got into it, um, I realised that it, it weeding, pruning, it got me into some kind of flow, but something called a flow, which is like, which I know now is some form of uh, meditative state, and it it links directly to things like attention restoration theory and stress reduction theory. So, you know, a paper we've just produced last week with Exeter University said, you know, gardening or even being in a garden or having green stuff around you is good for your physical, mental, and well-being, and I think. I intuitively knew that, but um, now sort of understanding to 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 explore explore that. Mm. And and my courgette, sorry to move you on to that, but my courgette, I think they're looking rather good. Yeah, um, I I think I think they're doing okay. Yeah, I think you uh, probably need to just keep a bit of feed uh, feeding them, and uh, yeah, keep keep to nurture them. Yeah, that would be my advice. And there'll be a lot of plants from just the one little thing sticking up out of the ground. Should be. You should, yeah, you should get you should get a number of courgettes as long as you keep feeding, yeah. Okay, listen, thank you very much indeed. I also appreciate your time, Hector. Thank you very much indeed uh, from Mumbai. I have to keep feeding them so they keep feeding us. Uh, fingers crossed at least for that. Thank you both very, very much indeed. Thank you Thank very you. much. Well, I'm very pleased to say that we can welcome now David Dominey, chartered horticulturalist and broadcaster. And we can say hello to Sue Stewart-Smith, psychiatrist and psychotherapist and author of The Well-Gardened Mind. Great to have you both on. In this section of the programme, we are going to talk about links between good mental health and horticulture. And, and David, you've conducted your own not scientific survey, but your own survey, which you think proves this conclusively. Yes, well, I think everybody identifies that getting closer to nature is where the human species should really be. And we've seen an awful lot of rise, really, with uh, technology in our daily lives. Our phones 10 years ago just used to make phone calls. Now it engages in every active part. An acceleration of children engaging with technology is separating them from nature. So, yes, we put a, I put a simple question out. Uh, across a variety of different social media and it came back where well, the question was was how many of you agree the premise that getting close to gardens plants and nature improves your physical and mental well-being 34 people said it didn't 10,520 said it did I think everybody comes to appreciate that element of closeness to plants and nature has a, 
an important part in making us feel good and making us feel human. So um, your book, The Well-Gardened Mind, Stephen Fry, the author and writer, said about it is a wholly convincing story of troubled minds, how troubled minds might find a way of reconnecting to themselves and rebuilding confidence and hope by way of nature. Given the fact that you are a very keen horticulturalist and also a psychiatrist and psychotherapist, uh, was this obvious to you from the start? No, actually, it wasn't. I, um, I came to gardening quite late in life when I married my husband, Tom Stuart Smith, the garden designer. And he, he really introduced me to this world. At the beginning, I was what I call a gardening skeptic. Um, I saw it as outdoor housework, except that it was slightly nicer to do it if the sun was shining. Um, so, so I came to it quite late, but I realized, I realized through, through, my, through my own, the effects of it on me at weekends, particularly in kind of decompressing from the, cons the consulting room and working in the NHS, which I did for a long time, um, that it was helping me enormously. And that really set me off on exploring the wider kind of mental health benefits, which I found to be very compelling once I started looking into them. We're going to and which it has to be said are not necessarily recognised in the in the sort well, of in, 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 in established in medical practice. Um, we're going to float in some pictures of your garden designed by your husband, uh, Tom, as we talk about uh, these issues. And you've been able to draw a correlation between education and horticulture and prisoners and horticulture. D tell us about that. I think one of the things about gardening is it's a very accessible form of creativity. So, you know, we're working with the natural natural growth force. This is the source of all life on the planet, really. Um, so we get in touch with that. But for, for us as individuals and for communities who engage in growing, it's very empowering. Um, if you think about other creative artistic endeavors, um, they're much harder to sort of learn from scratch, whereas you can pick up gardening very quickly. And that, for, for people, for instance, gardening in prisons or on um, inner city youth projects, quite quickly, um, someone can come to feel, goodness, I've really done something worthwhile. You know, I've grown this pumpkin and we've shared it and we've made soup from it. Um, or, you know, these beautiful flowers, everyone is admiring them. And it's, and it's a very, very immediate way. Well, not an immediate because you do have to wait, but it gives you a sense of um, increased self-esteem. Very, and, very and patience is definitely needed, as I've discovered in patience the four weeks needed, that I've been yes. growing, <laughs> growing vegetables yeah, in, my, yeah. in my garden here. David, Cultivation Street, one, one of your projects, and the link between the current crisis we are going through and a healthy mind brought about by gardening. What, what do you see there? Cultivation Street. Yeah, well, absolutely. Cultivation Street is a national campaign supporting community gardening around the country, school gardening and gardening for better health. We've been running for uh, eight years now and we've engaged with so many different communities because in, in some cases we find that gardening is in fact uh, a byproduct to so many other positive social uh, attributes. It's, it's reduction in isolation because people are, are gardening together. It's connecting and learning new projects. As Sue mentioned earlier, if we learn something new, it gives us that self-esteem, that feeling of achievement, which is hugely positive. It also uh, mixes different generations, the generation gaps, and people come from quite a diverse background all together in one area. The fact that we're growing things at the same time uh, is just one positive part to the so many other benefits of gardening together. And it's sharing that information. And during lockdown, where certain community groups and, and they have hubs of anywhere between 15 and you know 100 people in, in, in community gardening areas, they're keeping in touch with each other via WhatsApp or other social media, showing things that they're growing in their own greenhouses, sharing the success, sharing knowledge with each other. And that interaction is a hugely positive thing. A far cry from um, uh, people just sitting in and watching telly. I mean, the World Health Organization says that we're now spending, certainly in Europe, 90% of our lives indoors, whether it's a car, whether it's sleeping in our rooms, our, 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 our homes, our lounges, our offices, um, getting people outside engaging with nature that we've seen right the way across the board with Cultivation Street and our 300 ambassadors in garden centers up and down the country. We're tempting where possible to get people to start with gardening 
and start doing it together. You see, this is one of the things I'm wondering. There is momentum at the moment, and that's for pretty obvious reasons. But how do you keep that going? It's very difficult. I think if you look at a variety of different hobbies people have taken up during lockdown, and all of us who have been outside have seen many people jogging that have never jogged before, or cycling bikes, or any other of the activities that we're doing when we find ourselves with more time. How do you um, keep all that going when the temptation of general life sweeps back in, pubs and restaurants open, going back to work, you know, things that take the time that you have allotted specifically to engage with the garden, for instance. And I've always believed, having built quite a few gardens, um, that the garden at home to me is like that woolly jumper you wear on a Saturday morning. You put it on, it's scruffy, but it feels like the weekend. So as much as we can do to encourage people to not see there's a series of activities as a stopgap during lockdown, but more something that they enjoy to get out of. Perhaps they've started feeding birds, put a pond in the garden, started to grow their own, especially fruit, which is it doesn't necessarily need to be planted every year, and that they see the garden as a healer as well. It's not about weeding, watering, cutting the lawn. It's about water pistols with the kids. It's a barbecue. It's a scent of honeysuckle in the air. It's the sound of the birds on a spring morning. You know, it's the bumblebee buzzing by. It's to see a garden as a restorative effect in a world that's moving closer towards technology. And that's the magic Sue, of gardening. That's the magic of it indeed. Um, mm. Sue, with your scientific background, I, I know you actually started off as a um, studying English literature before you went into psychotherapy. Um, but you have come across scientific evidence, you say, that being outside, being involved in gardening can make people really feel more alive. Absolutely. It, it, the increased feeling of vitality that we, we can all experience through contact with nature and being outdoors um, is has been very, very thoroughly studied in recent years because of the growing interest in this area. Um, so and it's not surprising because, you know, we evolved in in nature. We you know, we're a grassland species. Um, it's in our genes, really, to respond to various aspects of the natural environment. So, for instance, you know, a flourishing landscape um, that, that in, in the deep remote past would have signaled, you know, uh, a good food, or at least good food on the way and a place to stay and a good place to survive in. These kind of places lower our blood pressure. Um, they lower our heart rate. They lower our cortisol levels. Um, they improve our mood, thought partly through the release of endorphins. Um, and also serotonin. Uh, and the other thing about getting outdoors is it stimulates dopamine, which is the motivational uh, neurotransmitter. Um, and this is actually widespread throughout the, the um, animal kingdom. Uh, and and, and one of the things you've said is that, that plants, motivates um, foraging. Hmm? Plants do not judge us. That, that, in terms of the therapeutics of gardening, is extremely important, yes. That, um, and, and I came across this uh, interviewing people working on gardening projects in prisons for whom it was, ex it was really crucial. But I heard others say it too, that the, the sense of um, the unconditional acceptance that we can feel in nature is very much part of its healing effects. And I think... I'm going to have David to stop you, Sue, sorry. Sorry, I've yeah. got to stop you because we are running out of time and I want to give David a chance to say something towards the end of the programme. Where you are sitting looks absolutely fantastic. How long does it take? How much patience do you need to be really successful? Or does that not actually matter? It's like any hobby. It's a series of stages. If you've never gardened before, just simply having a saucer with some damp tissue paper, crest seed over the top and have that on your kitchen windowsill see it germinate, crop the crest from that, put that into a sandwich with some, some lovely scrambled egg, toasted crackers, salt and pepper, and then bite into it. Just leads you on to something that you just keep wanting to do more. And, and that's the magic of the garden. It, it evolves around you. And I suppose what Sue was saying earlier on about the psychological effects, it's what's called, it's fascination. It takes your mind, provided you're not going out there with your mobile phone, it takes your mind off all the day-to-day -day troubles and worries. And as you part and interact with plants, you 
tendency to suspend your mind from everything that on 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 pressure terms and then just engage and enjoy seeing things grow. The favourite thing of me in this greenhouse is potting up whilst it's raining outside. I can hear the plinking of the rain on the panes of the window, warm inside, the lovely scent of plants. It makes you feel good. Well, I hope um, we get to that stage with uh, our vegetable patch because it's, it's showing signs of doing something and, and we've had a couple of things out of it already. Sue, thank you very much indeed. David, thank you also. Um, you both have got the most fantastic surroundings uh, and in, hopefully encouraging other people to do exactly the same, particularly in these trying times. We appreciate you coming on this programme. Uh, from me, David Foster, thank you for watching this edition of Roundtable. Get out, get dirty, get down on your hands and knees and get gardening. It'll do you good. That's the message. Goodbye for now.